Hi folks, so you've probably heard the term intrusion detection system or IDS before. I'm going to look into the details of how intrusion detection and prevention systems work. Um, so there's uh, the differences between the, what the terminology means for an IDS or an IPS. Um, we're going to look at the kinds of data sources that there are and the, have a little look at the um, related topic of host-based intrusion detection systems. Um, so if, you, if we look at some of the sources of information that are typically used and we're monitoring for signs of an attack that's taking place, um, you know, we've got the network-based um, sources of information and that includes looking at packets and then there's looking at higher level aggregated information about what's happening on the network and then there's looking into the technical detail of what's happening on the network infrastructure side of things um, and then that's in addition to all the monitoring that we're doing on hosts and servers that we have. Um, so on the network side of things, that includes kind of that aggregated information, or also known as NetFlow, um, which comes from the Cisco side of things. Basically, when we record statistics about header information, so like IP addresses and where they're destined for, and we can use that information to kind of visualize a traffic flow within a network. There's um, often with NetFlow, it will um, not be entirely representative because it will sample the data that's happening on the network so it won't give you like a super 100% complete view of what's happening. The network infrastructure side of things are uh, looking at things like DNS um, and um, ARP and uh, BGP and looking at how those protocols are currently routing information, looking at like routing tables um, and basically checking that they are what you'd expect um, because there are attacks against each of those um, separate protocols and in each case uh, those attacks often um, aim at basically um, interfering with the caching or the um, resolution of you know names or addresses and so we can basically check what um, what the current mappings are to see whether or not it looks like there's an attack taking place. Uh, and the other thing we can do is full packet capture. Um, and that's the most common way that we look at the net. When we're monitoring a network for attack, mostly what we're looking at is the packets on the network. So what information is being sent over the network. Um, and you know, when you're looking at packets, you can look at header information and you can also like the, the destination um, and source information, um, for example. And you can also look at the actual data um, contents of the packets. Um, <clears throat> and some of the software that's used to do that is the um, libpcap library and TCP dump. And Wireshark is a um, popular graphical tool. Um, but those are very, very common and popular um, software that it are used. So because all this is very complicated, it helps to automate the process of looking for events. Like if we are manually reading through every packet, trying to look for attacks, that obviously is not going to be realistic at all. Um, even if you are on a very low traffic network, um, doing just, you know, not very little on network, just the vast amount of packets that are involved in just the most mundane things. Uh, it would be very, um, you know, it's not it's not at all possible for a human to realistically look for attacks manually. So we need to create systems or, or implement systems that will do that for us. Um, and so we, we need to have um, automated approaches. And that's an, uh, essentially what an IDS is. So an intrusion detection system, an IDS, um, it monitors activity on a network and it produces um, reports and alerts. <clears throat> so it's looking for specific things and when it sees it, it generates some kind of alert or um, like a log file um, alert or whatever. And 
Uh, Network-based IDS does it by watching network traffic and monitoring um, multiple computers, for example, on a network or whatever's in the network segment uh, that the IDS is in. So that's usually what people think of an IDS. Host-based intrusion detection systems monitor system activity, such as like system calls, log files, um, like files that are that exist or are being modified, um, metadata, um, and so or only the network traffic for a specific system that it happens to be running on. Um, and so there's lots of overlap there with other kinds of um, with other things like um, integrity management, for example. Um, and so and system call monitoring. So there's there's a few um, uh, like related technologies, and so when you start talking about host-based intrusion detection system, there's almost always another um, term for the specific kind of host-based intrusion detection system that you're looking at. So an IPS is basically just an IDS that does something proactive. So when there's an actual alert, instead of just when there's an event that happens, instead of tr just triggering a log file, triggering an alert onto the, um, you know, onto your same system, it will actually do something proactive. So for example, it can reset a TCP connection <clears throat> or reconfigure a firewall um, when it looks like an attack's taking place to actually stop that attack in its tracks. Um, or for example, if you see, it looks like someone's got shell access to slap some, you know, you can just cut off access to that port, for example. So an IDS system might only um, monitor a traffic, um, but if there's enough processing power available, you might be able to configure it in a way where it does something about it, so that, and then you would call it an IPS. Um, or you could also call it an intrusion detection and prevention system, an IDPS. Um, essentially, these are all uh, get almost always the same software just configured in different ways. <clears throat> so um, the network design that you implement will depend on you know what your goal is there. So an IPS you'll typically place it in line in the network so that the traffic flows through the IPS in, a, in order to get to its destination so that it can actually do something proactive when it's not happy what's happening so it can set firewall rules or reset connections and things um, whereas an IDS can be placed anywhere on a network um, or it could just be literally on a completely different segment of your network and it's just having stuff forwarded to it to look at so you know with an IDS it, there's lots of there's more flexibility I guess the way that you design your network whereas an IPS has to be somewhere and it has to be timely enough has to be processing it quickly enough to actually do something about it while the actual events are happening. So if you had a small organization, you might have a simplified network like this where you've got you've you've got access to the internet flowing through an external firewall and you've got your like a perimeter firewall and you've got your IPS um, you know positioned between the firewall and, and the, the router um, which can forward the traffic to um, an IDS system and um, the and then your internal um, network, your intranet, is um, you know attached to the router. So you know you could add or remove the IPS or the IDS into these different parts of the diagram, so that you have, um, uh, for example, you can, if you want an IPS, it needs to be in line so it can do something about um, what's happening. Whereas an IDS could, you know, can sit somewhere else and it has the information forwarded to it. Um, if you had a slightly larger organization, you might have something like this, where you have um, the internet, um, a firewall, and then, you know, between the, um, the router, you've, you know, you basically you've got the inline uh, monitoring happening, and you've got the intranet, but you might also have other um, IPS or IDS instances that are running on different parts of your network. So in this case, we've got a um, wireless. <clears throat> access points and we've got a um, like our IDS system monitoring that part of the network and over here we have like a, a um, DMZ uh, demilitarized zone um, where we've got externally available services and we can monitor that um, 
or a tax as well. So you know you can you, basically you can figure it in however way you like. But but if you've got separate network segments, uh, that's an opportunity to do monitoring within those segments um, so that you've got uh, an accurate view of what's happening in different parts of your network. So there's broadly there's two categories of um, ways that you can detect attacks or so that something's going wrong on your network. Um, and the first of those is signature-based detection um, or misuse detection, where you're basically looking for specific characteristics of malicious behaviors. And you know, you've got a database of signatures that describe those behaviors and you um, basically comparing the current activity or behavior to those signatures, um, which are typically based on um, looking for specific strings within packets or doing pattern matching within packets. Um, and that's similar to the way that anti-malware software looks for known malicious files and processes on a computer. So you've got a, a bunch of attacks or malicious things that you're looking for and when you find that thing, um, then you obviously generate an alert. So for example, there's it, um, an attack will contain some steps that you can identify as being an attack. So for example, you might see a SQL injection. Um, you might see a known buffer overflow exploit that's taking place that has a known um, signature to the traffic that's generated by it, or some known shell code that's being flowing over the network. Um, and so you can write rules for um, the IDS system that trigger when they see um, these specific malicious things taking place. <clears throat> One of the nice things about signature-based detection is it's easy to understand, and when there is an alert generated, it's very clear what caused the problem. Um, the signatures are usually quite easy to understand, um, and you know what the security relevance of the alert is straight away because you know usually the specific signatures will say, it, uh, "We've detected a um, you know this exploit taking place or this shellcode or." you know, this um, SQL injection. Uh, and so it's really clear what's gone wrong and um, fairly easy to investigate to, to figure out whether or not it's, it's accurate. <clears throat> but there are weaknesses in signature-based detection approaches um, in that if um, basically it's impossible to be comprehensive in the signatures that you write. So it's, you know, you know, you'll capture some specific attacks, but there'll always be some malicious behavior that won't be captured by the signature, signatures that you've written. So, um, and because of that, you are constantly writing new signatures for new attacks, new um, exploits. Uh, so it's constantly being updated. Um, and so therefore, you know, in order to, um, be accurate, you need to um, basically constantly update uh, the um, IDS system and the signatures that you're using. Um, if the signatures that have been written are too specific, then um, the attack can be altered in minor ways and suddenly your, your signature rules won't work anymore. So, you know, you might have a looking at a very specific sequence of bytes. Uh, to, to say that that is a specific attack. But as soon as you, um, you, you, know, you get a different exploit that, it, that actually exploits the same vulnerability, uh, you can find that the rules suddenly are completely ineffective because they were written to detect, like say for example, the Metasploit exploit might be detected with 100% accuracy, but as soon as someone writes their own exploit, suddenly it, it evades detection because the rule was written um, not to detect the um, the possible ways of exploiting that vulnerability, but written specifically targeting what you've seen of this exploit before. So it's often possible to um, you know modify attack slightly to basically be missed by the um, signature like IDS rules that exist, and also just generally a signature based approach will not detect novel, unknown, zero-day attacks. So when there's something new, uh, the signatures that exist won't detect it. 
And that's similar to the problems with signature-based malware uh, detection as well. So an alternative approach um, is anomaly-based detection. And that's where you're looking for activity or behavior that's out of the ordinary. So when something happens that is different to what you'd expect, uh, then you would trigger an alert. Uh, and so you need some kind of model that um, against which observations are being evaluated. Um, and uh, the model might be based on a specification or it might be based on some learning that it's done on your network already or on um, you know, sp you know, the traffic that's flowing in your network. Um, and it's looking for things like um, statistical anomalies. So that's where your activity might differ from a baseline. So you've got some heuristics of what normally happens on your network. And then when something different happens on your network, it will tell you about it. So for example, there's different ports, protocols, bandwidth used. Um, payloads differ significantly from what's um, been in the past. Then um, you know, you'll trigger, trigger on that. Um, protocol anomalies where it looks at the traffic uh, and when it doesn't conform to the protocol specifications. So for example, if there's something on port 80 that's not HTTP or you know, you've got things on um, you, you know, the ports that are typically used for SSH or um, <clears throat> FTP for example and, but then the things that are happening on those ports don't match what you would expect, then you can trigger alerts and that might detect um, some attacks on those protocols. <coughs> so um, and this approach can theoretically cover zero-day attacks because we don't need to know about every attack that could take place in order to detect things that are out of the ordinary. Um, however, the weaknesses in these, this approach includes the fact that normal changes in activity can create alerts that are false positives. So if you're, um, just your use, usage changes, it can cause loads of um, alerts that are meaningless, not related to security, they're just things that have changed on the network. Um, but more, um, you know, worse is the fact that the anomalies that it detects can be very hard to understand. Um, you need to have a really high depth of understanding of security and also of the things that are normally happening on your network to make any sense of what the alerts are. So there's often no direct link to security. Like it won't say this is an attack, it will just say this is something different. Uh, so, so um, you know, it can be, um, or it will detect something that looks like um, something that is not, um, yeah, not usual, and then, then you spend a significant amount of time investigating um, whether it actually was an attack. So as soon as you add new systems to your network or services or upgrades to existing systems and services, it can require all of this to be tested and um, updated and validated all over again. So some of the general weaknesses in all of these approaches is that there's lots of ways that attacks can avoid being detected by an, an IDS. So it, it's possible to just flood the network with so much traffic that the IPS or, um, or IDS can't keep up with all the traffic. So if your IDS system is running on a low powered device um, or just doesn't have the capacity to process every packet that comes in, often what will happen is it will just stop analyzing the packets so an IDS will do what it can within the process processes that it has and then it will just kind of like miss things it doesn't have. Or if you're logging it uh, on one system and processing it on another, um, you might basically fall behind and be less real time if your IDS can't actually keep up with um, you know, the things that are being logged. Um, also, the way that um, you know the networking protocols work is they don't have timestamps in the packets themselves, so the capture software needs to do that, perform that function, and, and that can mean that you need to be aware of the different um, clock synchronization issues, and you know when your IDS system is telling you there was an attack, it might not match the system times on the on the different systems that are involved. 
Uh, and there's other problems to do with packet um, fragmentation and encryption. So packet fragmentation, um, it enables um, networks. Um, it's, it's a networking feature that's built into the protocols that exist so that you have different packet sizes um, for different segments of your network. Um, and so the way that it works is if you've got, you know, networks connected to networks um, and they've got different like maximum packet sizes, when the um, information flows across the networks, um, the larger packets can be broken down into multiple smaller packets and it gets all reassembled at the final destination. Uh, and in the past, that's been used to avoid IDS uh, detection by basically breaking the content of attacks down into, into smaller packets. And depending on the way that IDS systems are processing packets, if they're just looking at individual packets, um, as many do, um, or especially the, the way that they used to all function, then um, yeah, it can be a problem. So the many of the modern IDS systems try to do some um, deeper stateful analysis, so it will actually collate information about multiple packets while it's making its decision rather than just solely looking at individual packets. Um, but there's an example of um, FragRoute, which is an evasion tool which basically can do this for you, so it'll break down packets. Encryption is a challenge for IDS systems because um, as soon as you encrypt the traffic, it's different, and you can't actually see what's happening uh, within the, the communications, which can mean that um, you can't basically see an attack that's taking place. Um, so, the, and, and also, if you're just using different encoding and things, it can just make um, your rules ineffective. So, you know, nowadays, TLS encryption, um, SSL encryption, it's widespread when we're, um, you know, browsing the internet, it's used a lot. Um, and that provides authentication between the server and the client, and so if you are not the server or the client and you're trying to listen to the network and make sense of that traffic that's happening, it is no longer um, always possible to make sense of that. So on the... Um, so, so if you know if you've got an IDS system, and there's an attack taking place, but it's taking place via a, a encrypted connection, then uh, basically an IDS won't be able to detect the details of that attack that's taking place. Only that the connections happened and that there's some encrypted information flowing. So, there there are ways that you can get IDSs working though under those circumstances. Um, on the server end, you can have a separate machine that's close to the server or you know, running on the same server, as, you know, different software on the same server um, or hardware um, that basically provides the TLS connection um, and it leaves the connection in the clear on the system for analysis so that you can have um, like an IDS running on that system so that you can monitor the, the you know, traffic that's happening. So that's known as a hard, hardware security module. Um, it's also possible to kind of like man in the middle connections through proxies um, to read the data uh, and that can avoid alerting clients if they trust the certificates that are signed by the attacker or the monitor. So um, we'll come back to that in a separate topic around data loss prevention. But you know, if you're on a, a corporate network might basically um, perform a, essentially a man-in-the-middle attack against all the machines on the LAN um, to basically get uh, like insight into the packets that are happening on the network. So some of the limitations of IDS and IPS systems is you often can't actually tell if an attack was successful, only that it was attempted. So you can see the information that flowed over the network um, and but often the triggers that are happening with the rules that are happening will trigger regardless of whether or not the attack was successful. Um, if you're lucky or if the rules are written well, you'll get a separate trigger for the fact that an attack was successful. So for example, if it sees a, a shell 
<clears throat> like responding over the network, then it, if you know if those rules are written well, you'll get a separate alert that says that compromise has happened. But often you just get an alert that just says that an attack was attempted. Um, so you know you really would need to go and investigate and figure out what happened. Um, also, you know, network-based intrusion detection systems can only operate on the network segment that it gets exposed to. So if you have traffic happening on different segments, like different network segments within your organization, if the IDS is not being forwarded the packets from those segments or it doesn't exist on those segments, then it won't see any of that traffic. So, you know, it's good um, practice to segment your network. But if you also want to monitor your network for attacks, you need to think about how you're monitoring each of those segments. Um, so, and this kind of also leads to, all of the things I've been talking to leads to a problem of complexity. So you end up with lots of rules and you're analyzing every packet. Um, if you're doing stateful analysis, then you're reassembling packets. You're trying to consider and track the different connections that are taking place. Um, you know, can you know if your network's being flooded with connections, it can be very hard to keep track of all of the connections. Um, you know, that, that's quite a lot of like intensive processing and um, you know memory involved in in doing that successfully. In your examining protocols for quite complex rules, uh, and it can you know all of that can mean it can take a lot of resources to process all of this. Um, and because of the complexity, it also leads to false positives and negatives, which we'll talk about um, in a separate video. But the the actual accuracy can um, be, you know, not that good. It can it can suffer because of um, the complexity. And as I was saying before, often an attack can just be modified slightly to avoid uh, rules that exist, and it's a lot of uh, work to write good quality IDS rules. Um, and so signature based rules um, typically try and, try and um, account for this by filtering first on the high level rules or the high level parts of a rule, um, like looking at headers and ports for example, like the ports that are being used and the IP addresses involved, and only if all of that matches um, it will then look at um, whether uh, the signature, the, the packet content, uh, and start doing more computationally expensive things like pattern matching. But that can also, um, so there's a, you know, obviously that is a time saver, um, but, but if you have, pro have like, for example, services running on non-standard ports, a lot of IDS rules won't trigger because it will only trigger it's on the port um, that it would expect that service to be on. <clears throat> and an attack takes place on that port. So if you run run your services on a different port, the IDS rules that would normally trigger might not trigger. So that's an overview of <coughs> that's an overview of IDS systems and IPS systems. Some of the um, challenges that we face, uh, and one of the some of the reasons why it's quite difficult to write good quality rules, and um,